and welcome to uh, curiosity -ness. I'm here with Scott. Hey there. <laughs> Top of the morning. Scott, yeah, we're, we're pals. This is, in a, this is a different episode. We're not going to, it's not like an interview, but we're going to, this is our first book club episode, so we'll see how it goes. Book club. Um, Scott, are we, we're friends, I'd say, right? Yeah, I'd say so. What okay. You, yeah, we're is pretty there good friends. You want to say? Well, we haven't known each other for what a couple of years or only only. That's, that's friendship that's territory. A long time. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'd so say we're homies. So we're just. Hey, should we tell the people about the first time we met? Uh, yeah. Go ahead and tell, tell that my story. Favorite stories. <laughs> I forget that story. Let's see. Okay. I guess I'm a better friend. Apparently. <laughs> um, have you told the people how you're a balloon artist? Uh, it's never, I think it's come up a couple times, but I've never said it out loud. So Travis and I met doing a job at Downtown Disney where we make balloon animals for children. Okay. And Travis was training me. And so I can't remember what part of the night it was, but guess who rolls in? Batman himself. <laughs> Christian Bale. With his wife, two kids. So we all rock, paper, scissors just to see who, which one of us could go make balloons for him. And Travis and I won. And I was just shadowing Travis. Right. And he's like, but he told us no. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> okay, I do remember that night. But yeah. That, that was insane. Yeah, Christian Bale comes in in uh, total dad sweat workout clothes. Yep. With his whole family. <clears throat> just head down the whole time. I think it's going to be low key. And I come up and I'm like, hi. Do you, you want a Batman? Want, do you want a Batman? <laughs> <laughs> Insert laugh track. <laughs> we have a laugh track in the background. That's Sydney. She's, she's, uh, Sydney's been on the show. You guys remember her? She's my girlfriend and she laughs. Great laugh. Um, but yeah, he didn't, he didn't want any balloons. His wife politely said no. They were, they were polite. They were nice. All right, so we're here at it's eight a.m. Why? I've never recorded something this early. Sorry. Why did you make us do this at eight a.m.? I mean, it's so great to get up in the morning, get your day rolling, and it's I've like... got other stuff to do. Sorry, Travis. <laughs> yeah. My life doesn't revolve <laughs> around curiosity. -ness. Yeah, -ness. I understand curiosity. This is very low on everybody's priority list. <laughs> 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 so that's understandable. <laughs> Um, but let's do it. Let's start our book club. Let's do it. This is the first inaugural episode. Um, what was our book called? What's the official title? When Hitler did cocaine and Lenin lost his brain. Oh, I never realized it rhymed. Oh yeah. It's got a great ring to it. I never said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By Giles Milton. Giles or Giles Giles Milton. He when I posted about this on Twitter, he he responded and said, "Great." Oh, he gave you a shout out. Yeah. Oh, cool. So maybe he'll be listening to this. Wow. So a little extra pressure. I know. Seriously. But it's cool. He just uh, this book is just like a bunch of little chapters about different weird historical events that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. Yeah, we actually both listened to. Like the audio form, and at some points I was like, "Wait, how did we get here?" Because there's so many random snippets of like. At one point, we're talking about World War One, and then we move on to something completely, like some guy living on an iceberg that survives. <laughs> like yeah, totally random. Yeah, it jumps around <laughs> a lot, but it's good. I, oh I, yeah, I enjoyed I, it a lot. I love stories like these because it's stuff you don't really get taught. This kind of stuff in history classes in high school and whatever mm -hmm. but um this is where the, the gold is i'd say yeah a lot of untold history stories for sure um most definitely so let's just start okay. we'll just am i going first or are you going first i forgot who we said i'll go first okay yeah all right scott's confident yeah i go feel for great that's all you all right so you. We had to talk about this chapter in the book because it has the name of the title in it. Yeah. People would be disappointed <laughs> if we didn't. So it's um, when Hitler took cocaine. Okay. And it's some untold history facts about 
Hitler's health and personal life. So get this, folks. Hold on to your hats. <laughs> Every day for nine years, Hitler had this kind of sketchy doctor, Dr. Theodore Morell. And he would pump Hitler, give him a shot in the arm every day after his morning oatmeal. Did you have oatmeal this morning? Uh, no, I'm, I don't eat oatmeal. This okay. is gross. And he'd pump him, I'm going to butcher these technical names a little bit, but okay. with amphetamines, barbi barbitude, barbitude, barbituates, barbituates. <laughs> I took notes on my handwriting so bad. Look at that. <laughs> Bar Barpagets. <laughs> and morphine or an opiates. Okay. In other words, if you're not a drug expert, we got cocaine. We got drugs that calm you down. Those are the barbiturates. Okay. Because, yeah, what not a cocaine like a stimulant? Like a yeah. doper? Yeah. So he's taking both? Yes. Jeez. Well, not only that, he's also taking morphine slash, it was like a morphine codeine <laughs> combo. It was, yeah, insane. Right. Okay, you can understand now, like, Hitler's behavior and, like, things that we've heard about him. Mm -hmm. and anyway, so apparently, according to this doctor, and all of these are, like, written down in different medical journals and things, and he had a pretty unconventional diet. He gave up meat. And so he was eating like this weird like veggie mash thing or it was like a veggie puree. And mm -hmm. so it, it gave him all sorts of like constipation and diarrhea at the same time, apparently. He had like crazy indigestion, yes. indigestion didn't yeah. he? Like he would have to leave a table after he ate like a dinner party. He'd have to leave just to go far in the bathroom. Yeah, he had gnarly farts, apparently. <laughs> Even, like, before he changed his diet, like, he has bad, yeah. like, and he, this is him trying to deal with it, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had all sorts of, like, weird health problems. He had, like, sex drive issues, too, and so later on, they start putting bull semen in his magic yes. morning shoot-up from <laughs> Dr. <magic> morning <laughs> <shoot> <laughs> But anyway, so... After all of this, uh, some of Hitler's other doctors started to become concerned, like, dude, what, what is this guy giving him? Because some of it was kind of secret. Like, mm -hmm. Dr. Morell had the, the, Bi the Bible, the book we were reading, <laughs> even mentioned, like, these little gold packets that were, like, low-key. And apparently Hitler didn't even care. Like some of the doctors would approach him about some of the stuff that Dr. Morell was giving him. And he was like, I don't care as long as it makes me feel better. Nine more. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Which is just wild to me. Like what, do whatever makes you feel good. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. the side effects. Well, yeah, that's totally. Well, and he like this, what was the physician's name? The Dr. Dr. Morell. Morell. Yeah. He like was had a huge he was under pressure because like Hitler expected to like feel good after he had these drug injections. So that's why he had to like put all this crazy stuff and huge doses of everything. Yeah. Because if Hitler wasn't feeling good after he did it, Morel was out of there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I guess towards the end of Hitler's life, he was getting a daily injection of a, this magic concoction of 80 different drugs. Yeah. All at once. <laughs> It's crazy. Like, it totally explains, like, his, like, just crazy erratic behavior, oh, yeah. too. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I guess, too, apparently he was starting to become – he his body got used to cocaine. And so Dr. Morell created cocaine eye drops where the cocaine was so highly concentrated he could just – He would put cocaine right in his in eye? In his eyes. Yes. Just because, like, it just gets into your system more yeah. effectively or something? Apparently. Oh, that sounds horrible. It's wild. I don't even, like, visine drops in my eyes. Yeah, seriously. I'm such a baby. I can't even yeah. keep them open for water, so. <laughs> Let alone co cocaine. Yeah. That is just incredible. And it's all, like, really documented in these medical documents. It's not yeah. like this is, like, made up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they had medical documents for everything they gave them. Mm -hmm. Except some of, like... I guess the low key stuff that Dr. Morell. Well, that was like kind of the more classified stuff, I guess. This was what the 
1930s and stuff this was going on. Something like that. So even here, we didn't super have regulated drug and stuff yet, did we? I don't know. I don't think it was regulated as much, but it was maybe coming along. But that just sounds like they're like... Yeah have dr brown's miracle juice yeah, it'll make you live point. forever that's just full of weird stuff that it's not even regulated so you just say what's ever in it so that just seems like a a sign of the times there for sure wow great job thanks good story all right can i go you're up travis pressure's okay. on <clears throat> so my my first story i'm going to tell you folks about is called drunk on the titanic and we all know about the Titanic. Uh, 14th of April, 1912. It strikes an iceberg. Who's on the ship? Charles Hofflin. I think that's pronounced right? Yeah. Okay. Or Joggin. I kind of like Joggin. <laughs> Charles Joggin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what he was like a chef or something on the, on the ship. And basically, he goes to sleep. He knows that they they were in icy waters, but thought they were fine because the ship had, or the captain had kind of changed the direction of things. But they end up, you know, he ends up being like jolted away because they hit something um, at about eleven thirty-five. And then after he's after that, he's summoned to the bridge, so he has to go up there, and uh, he's given an a rundown of what's happened. They've hit the iceberg, and uh, but no one's really freaking out yet. This is what I didn't know. Have you seen the movie? Yeah, it's been a long time, but yeah. Yeah, I don't remember if this is included in the movie. I don't think so. Sid, Sid said that there's a drunk cook on the in the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. So I don't know. This might be in there. But um, but I don't remember this part about it hit the uh, the ship hit the iceberg, but no one was freaked out because the Titanic was unsinkable. And so it had these locks that would just like close off these like watertight compartments. Yep. So if it did ever get hit, it would just close it off and it wouldn't sink. But it, it didn't work. It's like they didn't test it because when the water came in and they closed it off, it weighed down the ship and then other parts started filling up. And so it like it inevitably was going to sink. It was just doomed to sink. Um, so it's going down. People start to realize that, oh, shit, this thing isn't really unsinkable. I don't know why we all thought that. And... <laughs> But they were so confident when they built it that it was unsinkable that they're on, they, the Titanic had 2,223 people on board, but only enough lifeboats for 1,178. So like a little more than half. That just seems so ridiculous. Well, it's uh, unsinkable. I mean, it makes sense. Right? Like, you know? why are we even bothered why, putting why these on here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why do we even need insurance? Yeah, I can see it all. <laughs> So this is all going down. You know, they're putting bread into the lifeboats and all this stuff. But Charles basically realizes he's a part of the crew, so he's not going to get saved. So he's like, well, let's go down and party. So he goes down and just drinks himself into oblivion, as the book says. Is that what you would do, Travis? What that, would you do? That wouldn't even cross my mind. Me neither. I would be like, let's let's figure out something here to, like, to get off the ship and do it. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about that. I was like, that's kind of seems like the last thing I would do. Like, I'd want to be in... Yeah. Have all my wit. Right. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, he just totally gave up hope. And he's yeah. like, well, I'm just getting drunk and going to have a good last stand. But, yeah, I wouldn't... <laughs> at least I think I would try to keep alive somehow. Yeah. I'd be Jack on the, on the door. But... Stick around for the story because we'll see what happens. Dun, he... dun, dun. <laughs> we don't have ads on this, so there's no ad break or anything. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, so he goes down. He drinks. Some people say he drank two bottles of whiskey, which is just incredible. I don't know how you could even do that. But he's down in his cabin doing that. He goes back up after he's he's drinking all this and. Uh, Starts throwing things off the deck to try to help people, but he eventually finds himself in the water with everybody else because the ship has sank. Uh, a boat comes around, a lifeboat, but there's no room on it. Uh, but one of his friends notices or recognizes Charlie, so just kind of like holds on to him, and he just kind of floats there with him. And the water's 
two below two degrees below freezing. So most people who are in the water died of hypothermia within 15 minutes. But Charles is pumped full of two bottles of whiskey, and he has been in the water for four hours total, and he still seems to be fine. I'm so sure he's crazy. cold. I'm sure he's not great, but. But okay, four hours after you're in the water, surely the whiskey would have taken effect. Yeah, it's. Well, I mean, two bottles of whiskey. <laughs> I wonder how much he had to eat that day. Yeah, how much bread did he have? Yeah. Because I'm real pruny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's what I was wondering. Because you're in the water for four hours, and I wonder how much he was moving too. Like, was he trying? Because the the guy had his arm, right? Yeah. I wonder if he was like trying to tread water or if he was just like if he was just after out. two bottles of whiskey, I would just be chilling. Yeah. <laughs> well it's like wouldn't he start to barf and stuff at that point yeah, too? I don't know. Unless there's just so much adrenaline and shock in the cold that you don't really feel it anymore. It must I don't know if it would affect you, so you yeah. wouldn't have like it's pretty miraculous drunk effects. But he's in there for four hours, <laughs> has not died, and then he's eventually rescued by you know, whoever came to rescue the, the Titanic people. But the story doesn't end there. That was not Charles's last shipwreck. Charles's. <laughs> Charles's. Apostrophe. There's an apostrophe there. <laughs> yes. Uh, he was also on board the SS Oregon, which sank in Boston Harbor, and he survived that disaster as well. Although we don't know if that involved two bottles of whiskey or not. <laughs> this guy, isn't that crazy? Legend of the Liquid Blanket, man. It's real. Yeah, it's good to know. I want to know if this is actually like scientifically based. Like, yeah. was it the whiskey that saved him or was it just he just got lucky somehow? You know? Yeah, it's wild. Because for real, they should include bottles of whiskey on lifeboats. Seriously. Well, that's my story. Nicely done, Travis. Thank you. Give it up for Travis, everyone. Yeah. Oh. I could edit in a laugh track, but um, yeah, I won't take the time. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. All right, what's yours? What's your next one? All right, you guys ready for this? <laughs> it's a one-way conversation. They can't, they can't respond. Well, can't we put on some cool tunes or something? <laughs> like, put that song on. You have to buy the rights to the oh, music. Oh, that's I, so I true. That. I forgot about how many people watch this insane. Okay, so the next uh, section, fun chapter that I really enjoyed that I thought was so interesting. I love war history. I don't know about you, Travis, but I find war history so fascinating. Me too. That's like the majority of this book almost. I'd yeah, say. definitely. Yeah. There was a lot of, a lot of that. <clears throat> um, this chapter was called Man's Best Friend. And it's – we're going to talk about three different animals who were the unsung heroes of – um, mostly World War One, I, I believe. Well, the, there's one at the end from World War Two, but anyway. So, the year's 1918, World War One. General John Seeley, who was a friend of Winston Churchill, had this war horse named Warrior. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's like that's the best you come up with. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of war horses named Warrior. Seriously. I mean, it is a great name. But it's a good name. Let's not knock it, but not very creative. Anyway, I mean, it, this, they didn't have any, like, anything super exciting as far as Warrior goes, but he, like, fearlessly evaded many, many close calls. Um, there's, like, a story of he's standing, like, in his horse pen or whatever, and a shell hits the horse next to him and absolutely just blows the other horse in half warrior was chilling he's like nah. <laughs> he was fine <laughs> good horse impression yeah thank you <clears throat> um there's also this pigeon okay so apparently in world war one it's hard Wait, it's, that's, that's the end of the war oh, story yeah, i was kind of like yeah it's worth mentioning but yeah is that related to the movie war horse did you ever see that i didn't see that one Moving on. Nay. So, apparently in World War One, <laughs> I didn't know this. It's it's hard to think about like before iPhones mm -hmm. sometimes, right? I mean, 
How, old, how old are you? 25. That's how old, how old I am. Yeah. Well, I guess we did grow up. We were like the last generation of kids to grow up without iPhones. When did you get your first cell phone? I got my cell phone when I was in middle school. Same here. Flip phone. But that's different than an iPhone. Totally. Still, but it was like as as kids we were we were growing up with cell phones and it's it's a stark reality. Yeah. You're never not within contact of your parents. Exactly. Yeah. So World War One. Mm-hmm. Apparently there was a army signal corps division that used messenger pigeons. Hey, kids, kids out there, they didn't have iPhones. They had to use Mother Nature, baby. <laughs> okay, so this guy, Major Whitlessy, Whitlessy, um, they go on this mission, and they're completely surrounded by enemy forces. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's so bad that American artillery is actually shooting on their position as well. And right. so they're surrounded, but they're also getting pounded by friendly fire. Very unfortunate. Yeah, that's messed up. So um, General, no, sorry, Major Whitlessy starts freaking out, and they try to get, I guess uh, they had radio, World War One, right? Yeah, they would have radio, yeah. So I, I guess, I don't know if they were out of range or their division didn't use it, but they were... This division of the army, or this little battalion, was using messenger pigeons. He well, because anybody could hear radio. It wasn't oh, secret. yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yes. So this is the first private. This is the per- first DM. Oh. So. DM's direct message for you older listeners out there. <laughs> so Major Whitlessly, Whitlessy, sorry, he's not Whitless. <laughs> Whitlessy. I keep thinking that's yeah. what his name is. That's so. an unfortunate name. He's trying to send a DM to his superiors. Mm-hmm. First bird. Can they <laughs> for, those who, for those who can't see, he's flapping right now. <laughs> First bird gets the tree line, instantly shot down. Man. Second bird. Okay, he waits a little bit. They're kind of talking about what to do. They're still getting pounded by friendly fire. Mm-hmm. They're surrounded by the Germans. Sends another one up. Insert flapping. <laughs> Again, like right when it kind of hits the tree line, I guess there weren't a lot of birds around because the Germans were shooting these things down. Like, yeah, so they, they were oh, aiming yes. for birds when they saw a bird. Oh, yeah. Yeah, apparently they knew that they were using messenger pigeons. <clears throat> Second one gets shot down. Third bird has a special name. What is it? I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right. It's French. Cher Ami? Charami, something like that. Right. It's French for dear friend. Okay. Okay. So this was Major Whitlessy's favorite, favorite messenger pigeon. It gets up to the tree line. The Germans see it. Machine gun starts. <laughs> a machine gun on a pigeon. That's just so unfair. So unfair. It gets shot. The guys lose all hope. But then, all of a sudden, flaps back above the tree line. The bird survives. Somehow. 65 minutes later, it shows up at their superior's house. Not his house. At at the encampment. Right. The allied encampment. His house. That was kind of good. He was living there, right? Yeah, he was living there, technically, I guess. Um. And the birds saved their lives. So apparently it had to get rushed into emergency surgery too, and it was shot through the breast and the eye. Mm -hmm. But it survived, made it, okay? And this little uh, battalion ended up surviving for four more days until relief came after the bird had delivered their position, friendly fire stopped. Um, But Cher Ami ended up, delivering 12 super important messages during World War I, uh, won numerous awards, including being placed in the Racing Pigeon Hall of Fame. Wow. And he had a number of other battle wounds. It was pretty awesome. He had a peg leg at one point. Yeah, they made like a custom leg for him, right? Pretty cool. Yeah. 
<clears throat> okay. And then the last, sorry, I went a little long on Man's Best Friend over here. No, go ahead. We're enjoying it. Yeah, I could tell. The crowd's going crazy. <laughs> Is this one of these, like, smart pages? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are we what? allowed to talk about, do you have to buy the rights for this notebook, too? or <laughs> Are we going to name drop something? We don't have to name drop it. But... Go ahead. What's it called? Well, it's called the Rocket Book Everlast. Oh, I've seen these. Yeah, it's super cool, actually, because um, I go through a lot of journals and notebooks and stuff. Um, I'm a big time journaler. Yeah. Got to get my thoughts out there. So this book, yeah, it has a little QR code. Right. And then it has all these um, different, I don't know what the technical term is, but you can mark uh, one of these symbols on the page and then you take a picture of it with your phone and it'll send it to wherever you want. So like your email, your Google Drive. You can send it to like all sorts of different apps and stuff. Oh, could you do Evernote? You think? Yeah, Evernote. Sweet. Totally. Yeah. This so is then, cool. And then you just take a wet towel and it erases, and you can reuse it forever. You just have to buy what? special pens for it. Oh, you have to use a special pen. Yeah, it's like an er. I didn't bring one, but it's like an erasable wow. ink pen. But yeah, you you buy them on Amazon or whatever, and then yeah, this is sweet. Yeah. Wait, wait. Like, show it. Look at it. It has a little QR yeah, it's code QR right there. QR code and then the little symbols on the bottom. And so you just put a little pen mark through the symbol. Uh huh. And that, I guess, tells like your oh. phone where to send it. So you have to like Keep scan you it. You have to scan it with the app though, or oh, something. Yeah, yeah. Right? There's an app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's an app, and you just hold your phone over it, and it scans it, and then sends it wherever you want. Wow. How much is this thing? It was like. It was cheap. It was like twenty dollars on Amazon. Wow. Yeah, this yeah. So pretty does it, cool. Does it like um convert your writing to text or something so you can search it <laughs> later? Ooh, I don't think so. I think that's a little All right, moving on. Anyway. Okay, you got one more friend best buddy thing for us? Yeah. Man's best friend. This was a good chapter. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> I could tell you liked it. <laughs> And this is my favorite animal here, my favorite stories with this guy. This guy was pretty cool, okay? Mm -hmm. His name was Stubby. Mm -hmm. Want to guess what kind of animal it was? Do you remember? Stubby would be a warthog. He's yanking your chain, people. He knows what it is. It was a dog. <laughs> it was a dog. Okay. <laughs> what kind of dog was Stubby? Ooh, I didn't write that down. I don't remember. I don't remember either. It was Why like, would you name a dog Stubby? It was a breed that... Like, wasn't something that I would remember. It wasn't like a lab or anything like that. <laughs> it wasn't a breed that you'd... That's all you would remember. I guess. Was it a lab or a golden retriever? That's all I know. <laughs> right? I don't know too much about dogs. So, okay. anyway. World War One. We're back in World War One, <laughs> And there's this private named Robert Conroy. Okay. And he was training in the 102nd Infantry... Um, and he actually found the dog. It was homeless. And um, they trained the dog. To, as he was sitting, he would bring his paw up to his eyebrow and salute his no. superior officers. Oh, yeah. That had wow. to be so cute. <laughs> would he sit up on his hind legs and do it? I don't think so. From what I – I mean, I haven't seen a picture of it, but what, what I was imagining was – I thought what I read was he was sitting and then he would bring one paw up to his eye. That is adorable. So cute. Um, so his superior officers were not very excited about having a dog around. Another mouth to feed, you know, smelly. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so Conroy actually smuggled him onto the ship as they were getting shipped out to the beaches of France, I believe. And so he smuggled him into like a coal bin. Pretty crazy. Wow. And then once they were like out to sea and he was like, okay, I think it's safe to bring him out. He brought the dog out and all, everybody on the ship like loved his little salute. <laughs> of course. yeah. Like this thing was a lifesaver for this, for Stubby. And so they get onto the beach and they're heading into battle and his superior, Private Conroy's superior officer is like, dude, get this dog out of here. Like, what are you doing? But then he saluted him. <laughs> Heart melted. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. So he got to stick around. He was sent into battle. Um, one of 
pretty early on, I guess, he was injured pretty bad by poisonous gas. And so, which actually turned out to be a real blessing. Plot twist. Oh, wow. As we'll see. As we'll see. So, obvious. So then the dog remembers this smell. Mm -hmm. And he had to go to like emergency surgery, yada, yada. So, next time as they're hanging out in the trenches, he hears the smell. The dog started freaking out. He was biting, barking his the allied soldiers and ended up saving countless lives. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, pretty crazy because he, he knew the scent and was the alarm there. So he wasn't even like trained to do that. He just smelled it before, remembered it didn't feel good afterwards, and just started going crazy again. School of hard knocks, baby. <laughs> wow, that's a cool story. It only took him, that's a smart dog, it only took one time, like one training lesson or whatever to figure it out. Yeah, I guess it was a near death thing, so it stuck with him pretty good. But yeah, there's some like crazy stories how he would find injured soldiers. He even found a German spy hiding one time and like tackled him and bit his leg. And wow. <laughs> that's pretty cool. He found him and he saluted him, and the soldier's like, oh, so cute. And then he <laughs> just attacks him. Yeah, so Stubby's pretty awesome. He was in 17 battles, four major offenses, won eight different medals, and got to meet three different presidents. So that's cool. Pretty wild. That's awesome. I love stories like that. Yeah. All right, I'm done with my my gibbering over here. That was good. Three different animals, Woo! all in one. Did it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go. For people who can't tell, we we only have one mic. I'm sorry. Things didn't work out, but uh, we're sharing a mic, so it might sound weird, but people in the video can see that. We're not kissing. Don't worry. <laughs> we're like just making out over this mic a, a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to go. This is the uh, the kamikaze pilot who survived, which have you ever, are you a fan of uh, Kirby Enthusiasm? You ever seen that? Mm -hmm. It's a uh, Larry David, co-creator of Seinfeld. There's a whole episode on this guy who's... He's a he was a kamikaze pilot, but survived. Oh wow! And he's like, "Did you just were you going in, and then at the last minute go, nah, not for me?" Because <laughs> it's like at the he talks about it at the end of this chapter, like there was like a hundred and something, uh, whatever kamikaze pilots who um, survived, but like there's just a stigma with that, especially in Japan, of like you're not supposed to survive this. Yeah, shame honor, it's a big deal. So this is the story. It's not, this isn't really a great story, but I just like that. I just think it's, it's ironic. But um, essentially this guy, these names are, are going to be hard to pronounce, but it's uh, Shigoshi Hamaz, Hamazono and Kiyoshi Agawa are both kind of pals and they both uh, enroll in the service for uh, Japan in 1945, this is. And, you know, they're doing their stuff, but um Pilots for kamikaze missions are it's supposed to be entirely voluntary. And uh, the one guy, Agawa, totally volunteers. He loves it. Hamazono also volunteers, but he noticed it like you were supposed to mark a an X if you declined or a circle if you volunteered. And some other guys marked X's because they didn't want to, but they were they were basically forced to mark a cross. It's hardcore. I could I could understand why people wouldn't want to volunteer for this yeah. sort of that, that's horrible like that just sounds horrible they or they say it's like I'm sure they said to the public it's totally voluntary to do it but it's really not so that's messed up um yeah he said as a military pilot there was no way to say no he said it was my duty to do that stuff so they're heading out um to their uh, kamikaze mission Agawa is very enthusiastic. He's been desperate to to do this kamikaze attack, and he's very excited. So he's going in first. He was the first to approach. He just flies into this uh, U.S. aircraft carrier called the USS Bunker Hill, and he goes in, and he pushes his plane into a dive while also dropping a 550-pound bomb. So he drops the bomb, and then he also crashes his plane into the flight deck. It's like... If you were in this like bunker hill, like if you were getting attacked by kamikaze pilots, you would have like no chance. It's so unfair. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But he crashes it in there. 
basically he's gone now. He lived his life, whatever he, he wanted to do that. So now it's Hamazono. He's going in to also, he's supposed to also hit the, uh, the USS bunker, but he goes in and basically, you know, uh, us fighters come in to meet him. There's a big dog fight, uh, for 35 minutes. Hamazono gets like just messed up. Like his aircraft is full of holes. He has a bunch of cuts and burns and he just decides to, to go back to the Japanese mainland. Um, he said, I was burned all over and only had five of my teeth left. Which, like, what is he... How do you lose teeth when you're in a his, fighter pilot? Like, see his head on the dash or something? <laughs> that just seems incredible. Unless they're shooting... Like, the bullets are coming in and knocking his teeth out like one of those uh, things at the fair. <laughs> you know, where you throw the ball at the clown's teeth? It was definitely like that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's how I pictured it. I was wondering too, Travis, like, I wonder what these planes were like. Because they knew that they were going to be, because this was a division where they they knew that the plane was just going to explode. So I wonder if, like, they weren't, I don't know what the technical term would be, but like, they weren't engineered as well, or That's they used point. cheaper material. Because they had to get them from A to B, but... I don't know. That no, that's the thought I was having. Yeah, I bet that's true. They were just cranking them out really fast to, because they, yeah, they just work good enough. Um, so that's it. He basically just goes back, but he, yeah, he had to live his life, rest of life with the stigma of being a, a kamikaze pilot who who had survived. <clears throat> and then he says uh, they used to tell us that the last words of the pilots were always "Long live the emperor" as they were going in, but he goes, "But I am sure that was a lie." They cried out what I would have cried. They called for their mothers, which I think is very true. Like, I'm sure there was a bunch of, uh, um, what's that called? The uh, Oh, propaganda mm. that like these pilots did this, you know, and, oh, yeah. and risked their life for, every, for Japan. But when you're actually in the moment, I'm sure there's very few who really wanted to do that. Well, and that's my story about the uh, kamikaze pilot. That was a cute one. So see, like he just got like the U.S. just put him off. It wasn't that great of a story. Sorry. I thought it was good. You did a great job. Thank you. I'm gonna do one more real quick. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So this is about a guy who survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki, both atomic bombs. <clears throat> and apparently there's a bunch of people who also did this too, which is cra like crazy. But uh, so this guy Siomu Yamaguchi was in Hiroshima. He was traveling to Hiroshima for business. 8.15 at si on the August 6, 1945, he gets off the tram. Here's a plane fly by, but doesn't think anything of it. It's just kind of a normal thing during war and stuff. And then all of a sudden, there's a huge flash in the sky. He was blown over, and the, the bomb went off. And I didn't know, did you know they detonate the, the nuclear bomb at 600 meters above Hiroshima? Yeah, so it's more of that. an effect. Yeah, because it gets like caught up in the atmosphere and stuff or something. I don't know. I thought it was because like, cause it's like a circle going off and it goes off in every way. So if it's higher up, it goes down huh. and everywhere. Yeah, that's wild. That like the it's not doing enough damage. They have to also do that. It's ridiculous. But it blasts his eardrums. Uh, he was temporarily blinded. All this stuff went to a shelter. He did survive the blast, but he went to a shelter where he found some of his other colleagues. Um, they worked at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, um, and they had just been sent to Hiroshima at the very day of the bombing for, for business, all these guys. And so they spent a night in the um, like ward together and kind of you know wrapped themselves up. But the next day, they feel good enough. They just want to go back home to their hometown of Nagasaki. Dun, dun, dun. Can you imagine? That's horrible. So they get back on the train. He <laughs> goes there. It, it's like that's incredible so he goes back he thinks he's going to be safe at home and just recover and recoup right goes back you think you had a bad week yeah for real Jeez. god this is just ridiculous but he goes back after two days of kind of recovering he just wants to go back to work he feels like he's good enough so he goes back to work he's telling his like co-workers about you know what happened and everything and then his boss goes impossible he's like come on you're an engineer that's not what happens and as he's saying those exact words 
the <laughs> blinding white flash goes through the whole room. Like, I'm, I don't, I feel like that might be a little exaggerated, but uh, it makes for a good story. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, they drop the second bomb on it. He miraculously survives this and his wife and his baby son. They all survived this too, the second or this whatever bombing. And uh, apparently 160 people were known to have lived through both bombings. That's crazy. How could you live through one nuclear bomb? But you lived through two. But then this is even weirder. In 1957, he was recognized as a Hibakusha, which is basically an explosion affected person. But it wasn't until 2009 that he was fish. He was officially allowed to describe himself as an Inuju Habukusha, which is a double bomb, double bomb survivor. Like he had to fight to be able to say he survived both bombs. Is that how it is in Japan? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. But that's just horrible. You have to fight just to say you survived both bombs, even though you already survived them. It's wild. But he lived to be 93 years old. Isn't that crazy? So Going through crazy. both bombs and stuff and, you know, all the after effects. But, uh... I wonder, like, what his health was like. Was he, like, super healthy, great shape, or... I don't know. It's crazy. He seemed... Yeah, he just said <clears throat> he viewed his long life as a path planted by God. So I think he was very grateful just to be alive. And, uh... And it seems like he appreciated life. It was his destiny, and... Cool guy. And he was also a, um outspoken opponent of nuclear weapons which i can understand why he would be (laughs) but yeah it's crazy all this stuff that happens there's so many stories like this 160 people live through both i had no idea that was like really possible all right you have another one are you done i could do one more or i or i don't have to it's up to you you. how long we've been doing this about an hour or 40 43 minutes Time really drags on in this show, doesn't it? <laughs> no, I meant like time flies when you're having fun. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you thought it, we'd been doing this for an hour. but I it just had... said like an hour. <laughs> All right. Let's do one more. If you can... It's a short one. Okay. Hit me with it. This chapter was called <clears throat> Let's Talk Gibberish. So we couldn't play like Talk Nerdy to Me. all right (laughs) try to contain your laughter i know you guys are just busting up at home it's okay i don't think we'll get like knocked for that as like a because i don't think it sounded anything like the real song oh yeah so we don't have to buy right so it's good thank you some things cut a little too deep travis (laughs) okay we're world world war two world war two second one it's the second world war for those of you who don't know the world war ii is the second world war wasn't world war one at the time called the great war i don't know i wasn't there all right <laughs> such a, like a teenager <laughs> answer <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> anyway so and uh, for the u.s armed forces they had a lot of different um different codes and things, you know, and like military practice, you would use no longer, they got rid of the messenger pigeons. They had to do something a little more tech, technologically advanced. The thing is, just like you said, Travis, they were using radio. So the enemy could receive all the radio transmissions. So apparently the Japanese code breakers were very good at this Mm -hmm. and they had cracked a lot of the, the U S armed forces codes early on. And so this this American missionary named Philip Johnston had this idea of using the Navajo language to um, write the military codes. Which and, is like incredibly hard to learn. Yeah, apparently it's a super, super difficult language. Like at the time, this guy, this missionary was one of the few people who wasn't a Navajo that spoke the language fluently on the planet. Man, that's it's incredible. Which makes for a great secret code. <laughs> it sure does. Especially when there's no dictionary on it because the Japanese would have to get the Navajo and then translate it into the English translation. So that was like the, 
that was the game changer for the Americans because even if they figured out the Navajo language, they couldn't translate it directly into Japanese. I see. They would have had to ju- that extra hoop of translating it into the English translation. So they were completely stumped. Like they had been super successful earlier on in World War II, but the Codebreakers literally thought it was gibberish. Like they couldn't understand it at all. Um, and it was pretty interesting. They used different Navajo words like whale was used to describe a battleship or like a hummingbird was used to describe a fighter plane. Oh, so. because they just didn't have words for like a battleship. Exactly. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So again, it was another like extra hoop for the Japanese code breakers to kind of jump through and that was it. They were completely unsuccessful. So it was never broken. It was never broken. No, not even close. Like they, they received like hundreds of messages every day and completely struck out. Wow. So, so they recruited like actual Navajo, you know, tribe members to do this stuff, so right? Apparently, there was only like a handful of them. It was this Philip Johnson guy, and if I'm remembering correctly, it was like one or two other. Um, people who knew knew the language because again it was like there are very few people in the world that spoke this language there was no dictionaries or anything like that no reference points so right yeah i think there was also i'm just riffing here but there was like a we the u.s like did not recognize these navajo talkers as like helping the war or anything like they didn't even receive recognition until like like just 10 years ago or something which is horrible oh, wow yeah they, like i think they did finally get recognition but it took forever and most of them were gone by then anyway it's sad yeah we're messed up um but cool thank you for sharing scott appreciate it how's our coffee by the way so good hey if you ever want to come on the show travis makes a mean cup of coffee and i mean that it's trader joe's medium roast the trick is to get the whole nice beans. Nice I got a good mug collection. For those who can't see, it's a Yosemite mug. But we we have a video. Get on the video. Watch us. Look at this. This one's. I got it from Iceland. You What's know what? It, it says I don't speak Icelandic. Really? It says that. That's cool. <laughs> I had uh, our mutual friend uh, Eric McCoy take it home for me in his luggage. That's right. <laughs> Okay, I got one more I want to do. Let's do it. This is a fun, quick one. It's pretty light, too. I feel like we've been getting a little heavy. Maybe not. But um, this is called Eiffel's Rival. So 1989, Gustav Eiffel built the uh, Eiffel Tower. 1889. Thank you. 1889, the, the Eiffel Tower is revealed. It's great. Everyone in, in France loves it. But... An English patriot by the name of Edward Watkin was unhappy about this. He resented it because it was literally five times higher than Britain's most celebrated monument at the time, which was Nelson's Column. So it was just towering over this thing. And so Edward Watkin was just pissed about this. Um, but he wasn't. A, he was, you know, kind of pissed. But he wanted to do something about it. So he wanted to just construct a, a British tower that would be. Taller, bigger, and more spectacular than anything the French could build because the French suck, according to Edward. And so he was kind of like a railway guy. So what he thought was he would build this big monument in Britain, and then he would build his railway there for tourists to go visit it. So it was kind of like a business expense, too. Um, so he could he could make money on it, too. So he commissioned this uh, this whatever contest i guess to submit design plans to beat the uh, eiffel tower just to make something better and his uh motto was anything paris can do london can do better so i don't know what you people think about that apparently not as we'll find out whoa spoiler (laughs) so architects from across the world start submitting designs and the prize was 500 guineas for the best design entry. Guinea pigs. <laughs> That's what I thought. 500 guinea pigs, right? Yeah. And you just sit in a box with them and they crawl all over you and kiss you. Oof. And poop. <laughs> just saying. 
Uh, so it was going to be called Watson's Metropolitan Tower Construction Company. That was like what this whole project was called. And it kind of became like this national pride thing. Everyone in Britain got very excited and was submitting things. But then Watkin even approached Gustav Eiffel and asked him if he wanted to submit an entry, which I find kind of weird. I don't know, just to kind of rub it in his face because he knew he'd said no. But uh, Gustav was like, if I erect my tower on French soil and then were to erect one in England, they would not think me so good a Frenchman as I hope I am. So basically he declined. Um, all these designs start coming in from Italy, Sweden, and Turkey. So kind of weird. I thought they would just come from Britain, but whatever. And then Watkins starts review reviewing them. And he's like, "These none of these are realistic. Like people are just submitting like crazy stuff. Like one was called Ye Vegetarian Tower and was submitted by the London Vegetarian Society. And it had hanging vegetable gardens and just weird stuff. <laughs> one was like made entirely out of glass. And it was... It was like way taller than the way taller than the Eiffel Tower, but totally glass. One had a rail, a road, and a railway leading to the top, which I don't get. That must have been just a massive mountain. Yeah. But I would love to see the design drawings of some of these because they yeah. they sound awesome. So Watkins going through these, they're all like ridiculous, and he, there was only one design that really stood out that could actually be built. And I'm going to describe it as it as it looked. And it was made of open metal lattice work, rose to a point at the top, standing upon four legs. It was, in every respect, an exact copy of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> the only difference was it was 87 feet taller. Like, that's hilarious. The only design, they just copy France. But it's selected as the winning entry. They figure that's the best that Britain can do. And so they start building it in 1981. They start building foundation holes. 1891. Did I say 1991 again? 1981. <laughs> okay. In 1891, they start building it. Uh, so it just keeps going. It, it reaches about 60 feet, and Londoners began to flock to what's eventually going to be called the Watkins Tower. And it's being built... 1894, three years have gone by, and it's only 150 feet high, so it's not quick progress. Um, but some about 100,000 people come to visit the stump, as it was called, and they're all just extremely disappointed to see a partial replica of the Eiffel Tower. And uh, basically by the end of 19, 1894, got that one right, uh, Joaquin basically ran out of money the general public was no longer enthused about this really slow building tower that was just a copy of the of the uh, Eiffel Tower and uh, it was abandoned. It remained there for the next 13 years but it was kind of an embarrassment and uh, eyesore on the London skyline and then it was finally blown up in 1907 but Watkin was dead by then and that was it. So I guess France is better than Britain. No comment. <laughs> I'm, I'm not here to make it enemies, Travis. So. Right. I mean, that's just judging their worth by the, the height of their towers and their monuments. That's true. But yeah, I just think it's hilarious that the best they could do is copy it just a little taller. And I looked up photos of this thing. It was being, it was literally being built and it looked exactly like it. Yeah. That's so funny. Wow. Well, that's it. We did it. We sure did. How long did we, how long did we go for? 54 minutes we talked. We've never spoken this long in our lives together. <laughs> no. Don't say that. Don't yeah. say that. Well, it's now uh, 9 a.m. It's still extremely early for me. Is this your normal wake-up situation? Yeah. I normally get up around 7 or 7.30-ish. So. Oh. Um, I like to get the day rolling, you know? I'm like an 8 a.m. kind of guy. Well, 9 should be fine then. Anyway. I had to get up and shower before you came over here. and Yeah, I didn't know I was going to be on camera, so I just threw a cap on. You look great. Hopefully you call it a cap? smell too bad. Well, you smell like you normally a do. A cap, a lid, a hat, whatever. <laughs> do you, you don't say lid ever, do you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this was fun. I had fun, did you? It's a great time. Thanks for having me, Travis. Yeah. It was a good book. I feel like we kind of just, I forced us to do a, 
a grade school book report. <laughs> but uh, but it was worth it. I I the book was great. Thank you. Is this how do you pronounce his name? Giles Milton. Giles. I don't know. Giles. I have to have him on the show next week. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Milton, for writing this book. We really appreciate it. It was a uh, it was a fun read. Illuminating. And uh, do you have a do you want people to go to your social media or anything like that? I'm not really on social media. You don't, you don't do anything. Sorry, ladies, he's taken to <laughs> unavailable. I know a lot of people were thinking of it. Thank you, Travis. But uh, and he's he's off the market. Uh, okay, so that I won't put any links to your stuff. Sorry, guys. He's a ghost. Um, but you can go to curiosityness.com and do all my stuff if you want. And uh, let me know if this was good. If we should do another book club review or if we should not do this again. But uh, any parting words, Scott? Nope. Listen to this guy. He's got good stuff. That's about it. Well, if they heard that, they already listened to a whole episode. So thank you, though. Appreciate the thought. All right. Well, that's it. Signing off. Goodbye.